back in December, I wrote the quote introducing Pavel Golik's talk, and I thought, hey, we are going to talk about the same quest, the quest to understand complexity. Like geneticists strive to understand how the interactions of thousands of genes make us who we are, ecologists strive to understand how interactions of thousands of species make ecosystems, forests, wetlands, rivers, oceans, what they are. Humans included here as one of the many species, but in the pre present epoch, one of sentinel influence on all the others. And after all, this is what I will focus on today. Because today it is high time we acknowledged the effects of our own actions. The web of interactions in the global ecosystem is complex. Yet, I am convinced that if we keep in mind the very basics of how the nature functions, this will help us guide our everyday actions. To make my point that we need to see the big picture and act responsibly, I need to answer two notorious questions. First, why do we have to bother with planetary processes? And second, is there anything each of us could possibly individually do to impact them? Before I continue to answering these two questions, let me invite you to join in solving two puzzles. As ecology has something to do with economics, both deal with our dwelling place or household, the puzzles are a simple calculation to do, which you can enjoy. Are your minds ready for a puzzle? Here they go. A small avocado and a big apple have together 190 calories. The avocado has 100 calories more than the apple. The question is, how many calories does the apple have? Take the very first number that comes to your mind and share it with your neighbor so that it sounds. Ready? Okay, here is the other one. And here they are again, costing together 1 euro 90. The avocado costs one euro more than the apple. The question is, how much does the apple cost? Again, share your first answer. How much is that? I hope many of you answered 90 to the first puzzle, though the answer is not 90. And I hope you were reluctant to answer 90 in the second puzzle, that is to say, an apple costs almost as much as an avocado. It doesn't here. Though the two, though mathematically, the two are the same puzzle. The first one was a little bit more abstract to most of us. We know something about energy in foods, but those who are not on a particular diet do not count calories every day. Confronted with an abstract problem, our brain simplifies the task, omitting the more than part. In the second puzzle, most of us already had some expectations for the answer, and our brains did not go that easily into the wrong logics. I show you this to point out to our natural short-sightedness. Our brains did not evolve to solve logical puzzles or to uncover processes like global issues but to acquire and distribute resources, to evaluate social context, to decide whether to cheat or cooperate. That is to solve everyday dilemmas of a social primate. Those early humans who solved these everyday dilemmas well, survived and reproduced, passing on their genes to us. With such inheritance, it is still today naturally hard for us to see, to accept and to react to problems like global issues. Here comes my first question. Why then bother with planetary processes in our day lives at all? That is why. Geologists say that for some decades we've been living in the new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. This is the time when these are us, humans, that shape the surface of the planet. If Jurassic means dinosaurs to you, Anthropocene is humans squared. And I bring the name Anthropocene here not as something for us to be afraid of, but as something to help us see and admit the fact. The time has come that these are not just the glaciers or tectonic movements, but a single species, Homo sapiens, ever more numerous, is ever faster changing the surface of the globe. To feed the growing population, Humans transform the surface of the planet to cropland. You turn the 
virtual globe and see the green and beige thinking forests and deserts. But when you start zooming in, vast territories start showing you regular patterns of either wetter or drier, but still farmland. Humans take a quarter of all productivity of the continents and the most productive lands are already taken and those still productive are disappearing ever faster. Anytime you see a graph of this shape, it tells you about acceleration, which is one of the characteristic features of Anthropocene. To maintain productivity of the soil, humans supply all this cropland with elements essential for plants' growth at the scale of changing global flows of these elements. For producing fertilizers, we drew from the atmosphere more nitrogen than all other life on Earth has in its whole history. Nitrogen now leaks from the lakes and fertilizes the seas, enhancing processes like toxic algal and bacterial blooms in waters. Phosphorus also leaks from the fields, and some researchers say the case of phosphorus is even bigger, as land deposits of this element are almost exhausted. Phosphorus shortage is something we need to find solution for, as it is a key building element of energy transfer molecules in all living things. Intensive agriculture demands high energy inputs, and we still get almost 90% of energy we use from burning organic remains. This results in enormous carbon dioxide emissions. Today, there is over 40% more of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than it was some 200 years ago, and possibly much more than ever has for the last 400,000 years. This does affect the climate, and this all affects other inhabitants of the planet. Their wild populations shrink and disappear. Your car windscreen is the first place to observe that. Two or three decades ago, driving a car on a longer route ended with a windscreen full of dead insects. Sad, but strangely sadder. This is a rare sight today, and this is not because we drive more slowly. A study conducted in Europe showed the overall biomass of flying insects is now a quarter of what it was just three decades ago. These are the pollinators of flowering plants, crops included, that are gone. Gone are the decomposers of the dead. Gone is the food for bigger animals, which do not do much better themselves. The global number of all wild vertebrates, all fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals, is now one third of what it was in the 70s. This means in some locations, in some ecosystems, their populations disappeared already. In other locations, they are too few to play their ecological roles. And ah, with the numbers, the diversity disappears. The estimates say at least 100 species go extinct each year. This means some three species lost today. How many species can we take out so that the global ecosystem as we know it still functions and does not collapse? What is left then? Something that opened my eyes a few years ago. An illustration to publish data found in a Geek comic series. Visualization of the global biomass of all mammals present on land, which shows every third or fourth mammal kilogram on land is us, humans, dark gray here. Then our animals, most of all animals grown as our food, cows, pigs, goats, sheep, more than double us in mass. Finally, wild mammals, here in green, make less than 3%. This is not how I imagined the planet. I live in a city. Okay, but out there I thought there are these deers, antelopes, elephants, carnivores, rodents. Uh -uh. They all make less than 3%. Now imagine extraterrestrials coming to Earth and what they see? Cows and humans. Rarely something else. And human influence reaches beyond land. Small animals living 10 kilometers down deep in the ocean in the Mariana Trench have their stomachs filled with plastic. Now, you will be not surprised to hear plastic nanoparticles are found much closer in lakes, rivers, drinking water. The many new substances we introduce into the air, soil, water, 
there are so many of them and in so small concentrations that only now we learn how to detect them in the environment. Hormones, antibiotics, antidepressants and many other things we ever more often use and excrete are not sieved out by water treatment plants. Fish do not die of tiny amounts of antidepressants. They just care less if it's day or night, if it's safe or not, if they will be preyed upon or not. Frogs do not die of tiny omnipresent amounts of hormones. They just change sex. Subtle effects, and we do not see them all yet, yet they translate into how the ecosystems function. I claim we need to face it all. Do you remember the puzzle and the apple? We need to do the mass and acknowledge our impact on the planet, even though our brains might be wired by evolution for different tasks. We need to make this effort in order to face global problems as complex as they might be. This pays off. We have already stopped a detrimental global process which we first triggered, the decline in the ozone layer. We understood the chemical chain reaction behind the phenomenon. We introduced international laws, cut free on emissions, and it helped. Indeed, it, it demanded a concerted international effort. Can we as individuals make an impact? To answer the second question, I refer you back to the basics of the economy of nature, to the flows of the very hard currency, energy. And this is very important. Remind yourselves of the very first classes in physics and in ecology, or maybe you saw it somewhere else. First, energy cannot be created out of nothing. For life on Earth, the sun is the main source of energy. Energy can be changed, but at each transformation from one form to another, some energy is lost. There is no perpetuum mobile. So yes, energy as currency. Acquire energy and transform it into our bodies, into our work, into our offspring. This is all we living things do. I want to show you this currency flows in more detail. An animal gets energy by consuming other organisms, but usually does not eat them whole. The arrows here represent the flows of energy. Then part of the consumed energy is excreted with feces and urine before it is used. Only a part is assimilated. Yet again, transformation of energy is costly. And as an animal grows and maintains its body, moves, reproduces, some energy is dissipated as what we call heat is lost in the process of respiration. An animal exhales a great deal of carbon and oxygen instead of building them into its body. A fraction of the consumed energy is built into tissues which can be preyed upon by other animals. And so it goes, from one level in the food chain to another. And each time, some 90% of energy is lost from the chain. A herbivore gets some 10% of what plants acquired, the first carnivore in the row gets some 10% of the 10% which is one, and so on. And all we do to recoup the lost energy, to reuse the waste material, to minimize the loss, is secondary and is energy consuming by itself. The simplest thing to do is do what the bison does. Eat plants and get even an order of magnitude more energy. Indeed, there are problems that need to be solved in a systemic and synchronized manner, but this shows us there are things each of us can do. And the, they are, again and again, our everyday individual choices. And I claim, along with many others, the single simple thing with greatest impact you can do is cut your meat consumption. Just keep in mind these calculations. Whatever we do to feed our growing population, we need to engage an order of magnitude more energy and naturally other resources, area of land, amount of fresh water, fertilizers, fossil fuels, when we produce meat, than when we produce plant food. Hypothetically, what if we all turned vegan? Consuming the same amount of calories, just replacing meat and dairy with vegetable protein and oils. 
we would lower greenhouse ga gas emissions in the next decade despite population growth. Animal food production is simply so much more energy consuming and more waste producing, carbon dioxide and methane included. Anytime you cut your animal food consumption a little, you make a big impact. For another example, let's take the avocado from our puzzle and a meatball of a similar energy content and compare the energetic costs of obtaining them. If you put these foods equivalent in their energy content on plates, where the size of each plate reflects the amount of resources that were used to produce the food, the meat comes on a very big plate. Plate being again the amount of water, fossil fuels and so on. Can we afford the luxury of a big plate? Our short-sighted minds will be fooling us to answer, yes, we can afford that. But we need to see beyond the edge of our own plate. See the big picture, see what is not easily seen. We haven't seen the freon particle reacting, breaking down in the ozonosphere either. This time, there is just a few links more to understand, links between our plate and the amount of fossil fuels burned to understand the whole process. Then we can start a chain reaction ourselves, take this knowledge and act. Take your steak every second time you otherwise would. Maybe one portion of any meat a week would be enough. Joyfully replace meat with lentils, Indian dal or your local traditional lentil dish. They are forgotten but plenty. And explain someone the basics of energy flows through the system and why this matters. Someone who will react and keep the chain reaction going. Copernicus once showed us the Earth is just a planet in a planetary system. Darwin showed us humans are just a species among other species. These are very good reasons not to feel that special, nor that responsible. But want it or not, today, in the Anthropocene, the world is back in our hands. Thank you. <laughs>